Hi, I'm Jay, and thanks for spending some of your attention and time with me today. Today we're talking about something that I've been calling Project 2031, and it's rooted in a quote by Bill Gates that I like, which is that most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years, which to me says that there's some serious power in putting together a 10-year plan. And this particular 10-year plan has been triggered a little bit by the fact that, well, I'm 45. And that has meant that I am pretty much reaching the halfway point on most measures of life, whether you are talking about a total lifespan, uh, whether you're talking about a career lifespan from 25-ish after college until 65-ish for retirement, no matter sort of how you tend to slice and dice life up, uh, 45 is kind of the midpoint for an awful lot of people. Now, a lot of Men in particular seem to have midlife crises about that uh, point in their life. And I'm a little bit more uh, tilted toward trying to be contemplative and figure out what to do with the future as opposed to uh, running out and uh, ruining the rest of my life uh, with poor life choices at this point. And so what I started doing was coming up with a list of the things that I would like to make sure that in the second half of my life are present. And the first of those is... I do really like computers and software. From the first time that I sat down in front of a real computer in 1984, the age of nine, the TRS-80, and I started and uh, TI-994As, and if I started writing basic and logo programs, and from that point on, I was in love with what I could do with computers. So I want to keep that aspect of my life present, whether that's making websites, making applications, uh, doing this kind of video production. I want to make sure that software and computers and the digital world is a part of my life. I also enjoy writing. My degree happens to be in English literature and writing and a little bit of linguistics. And I enjoy writing. I largely set writing down because it wasn't the best option I had available for how to make a living with the things that I enjoy. And so writing sat for a long time. I have returned to writing in recent years and uh, have no partial manuscripts for a couple of experimental things I tried to do and I've got some notes and a partial manuscript on something that I'm rolling forward with but I'm hoping to keep writing and writing fiction in particular an active part of my life going forward. All right so we've also got music and you can see in my background that there's a guitar here and in the room behind me, there's a, a much bigger musical instrument collection. And the making of music and the listening of music, but more the making of music, is a thing that I have found community in and that I enjoy and would like to make sure stays a part of my life going forward. There is also making things in my workshop, and that includes making things out of wood, and leather, and glass, and various other materials, but physically making stuff, making actual physical items provides a nice contrast to the digital world where sometimes the things that we make can feel a little bit intangible and like there's no substance to them. And I really do like some of the work happening with my hands in the workshop. I enjoy cooking, making beer, making cheese, doing barbecue, the, the idea of, of making food and drink and sharing it with people is a thing that I absolutely want to make sure is a big part of my life going forward. And then I enjoy teaching and sharing what I know and sharing my understanding of how the world works and how things work and how, how things can uh, fit together. I enjoy that kind of teaching and I want to make sure that that is an important part of my life going forward. But over the course of my life, of all of those things that I really enjoy doing, software is the one that has always had the potential to make me the most money. And so that is generally where I have spent most of my time. My time has very heavily tilted toward a 40 hour a week software career as a consultant that I've done for these last 20 years. And then in the little slivers of time between that and my other obligations, I've squeezed in the participating in music and the, spent, the time spent in the workshop and the time spent writing. And that narrow sliver of time is out of balance with how I would in, 
prefer to spend my time and how I would enjoy my time being spent. And so for a lot of people, the solution to that would be to cut that sliver to zero, to just throw in the towel, leave everything behind, walk away from a career and do what most people would call retirement, that we just completely stop. And the thing is that the way my mind works and the way I am oriented to the world, the idea of sitting around on a beach doesn't really work for me. I've actually tried it a few times and I get about two days into it and my brain gets itchy and I want to start doing something. Even if that something is to just go find a national park and explore the trails and see what's out there. I don't really sit around very well. And so what I'm about to describe in my 10 year plan to many people would be called planning for an early retirement of sorts. And yet for me, that word is really not the exact match. I'm going to probably use it several times in this, uh, video and probably in future videos, but I want to clarify a little bit what I mean when I use, when I'm using the word, as opposed to what I think most people mean when they use the word. So most people uh, tend to talk about it being a life of leisure and travel and that sort of thing. And I do want to include some of those things. Um, but for me, it's mostly about freedom from obligation. I don't want to be obligated to do anything in particular on a given day. The less that I can be obligated to do, the happier that I generally am. If I can get up and say, today is a beautiful day, we should go outside and do something. Or today I woke up with an idea for something to make in the workshop, and I would really like to go out to the workshop instead of sitting in front of the computer today. Or vice versa. I'm really sore and tired from that hike we took yesterday, so I would like to sit in front of the computer today and maybe make some videos. And that flexibility has not generally been an option when working for other people on a contract basis or uh, for most people a job that just really doesn't work out that way so what it really comes down to is that i want the freedom to say no and that freedom to say no largely comes in in, in a package that looks a lot like what we talk about when we say planning for retirement making sure that there is enough money available so that if i say no to making money at a job or a contract that today, that that does not impact the ability to keep a roof over my head, food on the table, uh, a vehicle or transportation available to get me around. I want to be able to say no uh, to a job. I, want, I also want to be able to say no to, uh, for instance, if, if the making of videos becomes something that I uh, I'm gathering an audience and, and people say that they want videos more often or they want videos of a, very, a specific a specific kind and they don't want me to make that other kind of video anymore. I want the freedom to say no and not worry about the fact that saying no might cut my revenue down. Um, same thing is true in the workshop. If I am making a product that I'm not enjoying making, I want to be able to say, no, I don't want to make this. I don't care how profitable it is. I want to be able to make what I want to enjoy. And my hope will be that I will be able to start saying no to the things that I don't want to do more often and yes to the things I want to, and that I will still be able to find some ways to bring in some revenue in addition to savings. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense. And I want to talk a little bit more about what the plan itself looks like. So one of the things that I've looked at is some research on what makes people in, in retirement or in financial freedom or whatever we want to call it, what makes people in that situation happy? What makes a person who has crossed over that line and is no longer working an ob obligatory 40 hours a week at a contract or a job or in a business that they've created, what is it that makes those people happy? And there's been some research that's been, that's been done and there's sort of a few things that I could latched in on in that research that I have picked to be um, sort of miles, not milestone, more uh, guiding principles for figuring this plan out. The first of those is that happy retirees have for their savings, for their nest egg going into retirement, somewhere between 500,000 and 900,000. That doesn't mean that people over 900,000 aren't happy. It just means that the increase in, in happiness, so as you have more and more money and your happiness also increases, that those two things sort of work together, uh, is at its strongest between 500,000 and 900,000 in retirement funding. 
uh, it starts to flatten out. Having 1.8 million instead of 900,000 does not increase your happiness the same way going from 500,000 does to $900,000. And the, the big takeaway for me of that was that those numbers were lower than I thought they had to be. A lot of the time I hear that a million is just not even remotely enough. You better have more like two to five. And as a result, for a long time, I didn't really have an optimistic outlook that I was going to be able to retire at a 65-ish kind of time frame, much less any earlier. And some of this this number and some planning and some figuring things out has made it look like, oh, that's actually not only are we uh, going to be okay if we could hit those numbers, but we actually might, in our particular case, be able to do better than those numbers. But this really uh, gave me a little bit of a, a chance to rethink my understanding of the whole thing. All right. So one of the other things that happy retirees have in common is that they have zero debt. They do not owe on their cars. They do not owe credit card debt. They do not owe other loan debt. They do not own, they do not owe still on their mortgage or they're very close to having their mortgage paid off, but that they have reduced their expenses by ensuring that they are no longer spending money on the past. They are spending money on the future, which we'll talk about in a bit. And the biggest one is actually that happy retirees are deliberate about how they spend their time. Uh, Wes Moss, who's one of the people who did, who was involved in this research, talks about core pursuits, that people in retirement who are happy have more core pursuits than people who do not. And your core pursuits can be working a part-time job. They can be a hobby sort of on steroids is, is one of the ways he puts it. So a thing that you do, not just casually, but it is, it is a core pursuit of your life. It's a thing that you do regularly. Like in my case at the moment, I spend my Sundays in the workshop and that, that turns it into a deliberate effort. Um, that people who are involved in a, in a community band are treating music as more of a core pursuit of a, a deliberate thing than people who just occasionally sit down at the piano and play something. And people who are happy in retirement generally have about twice as many as those who are unhappy. And this is part of that idea of retirement or chasing for financial freedom is really about reaching for something, about chasing towards something rather than running away from something. If all you are trying to do is to get away from the work and just the freedom from obligation, but you have no thing you are running toward, no thing you are aiming for, no thing to occupy your time, to fill your time, to fill your attention, to fill your energy, you are going to be... Um, less happy. And this echoes what I have heard from the elderly people in my life. Um, my wife's grandfather at one point when we were talking about retirement and, and he was about 90 years old at the time. And he said, and I won't say it quite as colorfully as he did, but he said, if, if when I turned 65, I had known that I was going to live you know, 25 or 30 years longer I would have waited to retire. And that was partially because he didn't have a lot of things that he wanted to do in retirement. And he would have, he said he'd been happier working, but on a reduced basis or more on his own terms instead of quitting completely. And so those things about being happy in retirement form the backbone of the strategy around this 10 year plan. Uh, we are looking to save to make sure that there is enough money in retirement that we hit at least that five to nine hundred thousand range. But hopefully for us, in our particular case, more than that, we are going to be looking to eliminate our expenses in in large part. Those expenses being in the form of debt, and we are looking to make sure that uh, we are prepping for a, a life after this. These goals are achieved, and by ensuring that we have core pursuits available to us. Now. I am the kind of person who life tends to throw curveballs, and so I tend to spend a lot of time watching plan A go down in flames, plan B go down in flames, plan C go down in flames. I spend a lot of time down near plans E, F, and even Q, R, uh, and, and further down the alphabet, quite frankly. And so I want to establish that with what we are talking about as a plan, we realistically, my wife and I, are already at a point that our fallback plan could be that we continue to work until age 65, 
and that uh, at age 65, Medicare, Social Security, and what we have saved is already enough to probably have what most people consider a happy retirement. And so most of what we were talking about in this 10-year plan is seeing if we can possibly move that 65 date, for me in particular, uh, from 65 back to 55 and still have it be enough to make this work. But we are operating a little bit with a net in that our fallback plan ensures that we do have enough if we just work continuing to go to 65. And uh, quite frankly, this fallback plan can even work if we don't really save a whole lot more uh, between now and 65 in those next 20 years. All right, so on that savings part of things, what does that look like? And I'm going to probably do videos that'll dig into each and every one of these pieces individually in a little bit more detail, but I want to sort of give just a real high level description of this plan so I can refer back to this when those future videos happen. All right. And so what we're talking about is that uh, I work on a contract basis. I generally bill by the hour and uh, sell my time in, in 500,000, 2,000 hour increments. So three months, six months and a year's worth of time. And because I work by the hour, when I get raises, it's more in the form of uh, my next gig can sometimes have a higher rate in, rate than the previous gig. And what we are going to do is we're effectively, and this had already this had already happened before this year, we are marking that all of my future rate increases are going to go directly to savings. So if I get a rate increase next year, uh, all of that revenue is going to go toward savings of one side or another all of the side hustles. So anything that I do with my writing, anything that I do with the workshop, anything that comes in in YouTube revenue or video stuff or, or online digital kind of business creation that I do along the way, all of that's going to go either to savings or it's going to be reinvested in those endeavors to try to make them uh, healthier for bringing in revenue after it is needed, as opposed to right now where uh, the contract work and my wife's job are enough that we don't, uh, need that rate increase money or the side hustle money to go and that all of that saving is, go is going to go to both retirement accounts which are called qualified accounts we can dive into that whole quagmire later and some that is not retirement savings all right so these numbers are not our actual numbers they just make the math really easy and sort of to demonstrate a point so let's just say that for right now um my software world is bringing in a hundred thousand that, like I say, that's not my actual number, but I mostly want to describe these three phases here broken by the first year being the 10 years of project 2031 between now and the year 2031. And then the years between, um, either depending on how you look at it, 55 to 59 and a half, which is the age at which you're first allowed to touch your 401ks, IRAs, and that sort of stuff without any penalties or until we hit social security, which is at age 62. And so maybe this middle one gets split a little bit. Um, what that looks like is going to be shaped up over the, over time as to exactly what that middle one looks like. And then the third phase is sort of a, you know, once all of, all of the money streams are available to us, what that looks like. And so for right now, we're going to live on, on my end of things, at least we're going to live off of my software revenue, everything else goes to savings. And then when we hit 55, the ideal would be that we can then start living off of the non-retirement savings because that is available without any taxes, without any penalties. It certainly has been taxed along the way. Some book sales, uh, the workshop output, any video revenue or that sort of side hustle kind of money and anything else we come up with that might bring in money along the way. That's what we will live off of between age 50 and then 55 and then to 59 and a half, which we can touch retirement savings or until a social security check kicks in at 62 or 65 or 67 or 70, whenever we decide based on uh, our planning, when that makes the most sense for us. And then after that, everything is available. Now, the bottom numbers are here to demonstrate a thing that I got sort of hung up on when talking to financial planners or watching and reading financial planner books and information videos and all that kind of stuff. And they would talk about how much do you need for retirement? And they would always start with, and insurance agents did this too. Everybody did it. They would start with what is your current salary? What do you make now? And if 
my current salary was a hundred thousand. Again, we're doing this just for easy math and to demonstrate the principle here. They would then say, well, once you decide to retire, you're going to need a hundred thousand dollars going forward. And the thing is an awful lot of people, if you do this right, you actually need closer to half of what you are currently making instead of a hundred percent. Now, over time after that inflation kicks in, there's a bunch of things to consider. But I want you to consider that whether you might already be living on half or less than half of the money you're making. And this uh, is leaving taxes aside, which are true either way. Uh, but if you look at what the lending guidelines are for housing in America, the general mortgage principal cutoff is that you can spend 33% of your income on a house. Okay. And then if you decide to go get a car loan, there's a 43% threshold that's generally allowed for you to have payments on car payments, credit cards, and any other kind of debt. And then if you were to take the advice that you're supposed to save 20% of your income and you add those things together. So what you are paying for housing, what you are paying for transportation, and uh, especially if you borrow for cars, uh, for transportation and other debt, and your savings rate, that means that if you were living that life, ma sort of maxed out on your house, maxed out on your other debt, and still somehow managing to make your savings, you're already living on 37%. So in a $100,000 thing, you're talking about you're living on $37,000 already. And so it's highly probable you might be able to live on half of what you did. Now, granted, medical expenses, some other things go up in retirement, but uh, I mostly wanted to put that out there because it's a thing I think about and it's how we are looking at what our real expenses are and what those expenses will be in the future as opposed to just assuming that our, our current expenses, which includes the mortgage, the car payments, and the other stuff, that that's just going to continue forever, given that one of our other the planks of this is to drive that debt down in particular. All right, so based on that idea, if you had that $100,000 salary, which is $83,33 a month, you might very well be living on $3,000 a month. And when you look at a social security payment, which for the, my wife and myself, we've calculated, uh, according to the, the Social Security Administration's website, we're going to get it at 62. Our checks would be 1800 a month each, um, which means that that number is actually fairly achievable on social security, even though I know that actually won't be enough um, to cover things like the supplements to Medicare and other things that travel and all those other things that we want in that future. All right. So when you're trying to figure out how much you actually need, you need to consider your living expenses, your debt, your travel, your health care, all those kinds of things together. And one of the ways that you can make that number not as high is to is to work along the way to cut your costs. And for us, a lot of those costs have been in the form of debt. And debt is earning for the past instead of the present or the future. So me working at my job or my contract and earning hour after hour a pile of money, and then that money has to go to pay for things I bought in the past instead of things I'm going to buy in the future or things that I'm going to buy today. I already bought the car in 2017, but it's not paid off. And so that money is going to pay for an expense that I already incurred several years ago. All right, so we are tackling a debt pay down. And again, these are sample numbers. This is not our entire pile of debt, and these are not the actual numbers for ours in particular, but they are the kinds of examples of how a debt pay down goes. And I'm probably going to do a, a more in-depth video on paying down debt in general uh, in the future here. But let's just say you've got, in my case, a truck payment that is uh, $525 a month. It's five and a half percent interest. We had to install a new air conditioning system in our house because it failed. And the two-year loan on that is $192,000, but it was a zero, $192 a month. Uh, but it was a it was an interest only loan, and so that actually or interest free loan I should say, and it doesn't have uh, any interest on it. And then we have some credit card stuff that was you know furniture and emergency vet bills and some of that kind of stuff because our emergency fund wasn't quite where it needed to be. And so you take each of those payments, and you basically take 
uh, for instance, the credit card payment, and you increase that payment. And you take that $200 a month credit card payment and turn it into $400 a month. And you make that payment until that card is paid off. And then you take that $400 a month and apply it to, in this instance, the truck payment, which is an interest-bearing expense versus the air conditioning loan, which does not have any interest on it. And that sort of guarantees you a five and a half, a four and a half or five and a half percent interest uh, for whatever the interest rate on that loan was return on that money. And now we are paying $925 a month on the truck payment instead of $400 a month. And when the truck is paid off, you take that, you take that $900 and $925 and you apply it to the next thing on the debt. And for a lot of people, there are three or four small little credit cards or uh, maybe not so small little credit cards that if you follow this cascade, you can you might find yourself paying really large numbers when you get four or five accounts knocked off and you're working away in here, but you were already paying large amounts to debt. It's just now cascading its way. Uh, you frequently hear this called either a debt avalanche or a debt snowball. Um, there's actually specific definitions for each of those things that I'm not going to get into in this particular video, but they're out there. All right, which leads then eventually to a plan that puts us moving as well. So this is part of our, um, you know, we pay down our debt, we save up enough for retirement or for this, this version of our life, and then we are likely going to move. And that's partially because at the moment I live in Minnesota and I have a driveway that because of the way the winters are, coats with ice and makes it fairly dangerous to bring the trash out every week. And as I age, as like a lot of people, the willingness to risk falling is go is dropping dramatically. And so we are probably looking at some point in this plan to move somewhere else. So we I'm going to do a whole video at some point about how to figure out the right place to go to move. And one of the big factors in that is looking at the cost of living. We will not move from our Minneapolis location to anywhere that is more expensive to move. So for instance, if I consider the cost of living in Minnesota and I take $100,000 a year, again, to make nice round numbers that are easy to calculate, um, if I were to move to San Francisco, I would need $276,000 a year in order to have the same lifestyle that I have in Minneapolis. If I was to move to Mesa, Arizona, it's only $102,000, but it is a little bit more expensive. And then there are places like one of the candidates on my list of places we're going to check out and see if maybe we might want to retire there is Las Cruces, New Mexico, where $100,000, uh, you only need $82,000 to have that same lifestyle going forward, which when you take that nest egg, so if we were talking about that 500, that, that 500 to $900,000 range that happy retirees have saved up, if you have the 900,000 version of that and you take that and go to retire, you now have the equivalent of $324,000 in San Francisco. If you take uh, that 900,000 to Mesa, Arizona, it drops a little bit to 882,000. But if you take that $900,000 to Las Cruces, New Mexico, it's now in spending terms worth 1.1 million. And this is a way to sort of counteract some of that inflationary stuff that all the retirement plans are talking about, planners are talking about, because by moving somewhere cheaper, you can effectively get more out of the money that you have saved, more out of the money you were getting for, from Social Security, and more out of the money that you were getting from any of your additional income streams going forward. All right, so that leads to sort of, the, that's a high level view of, of Project 2031 and sort of forms a framework for what my plan for this video channel is, which is that I wanna talk about my progress on Project 2031. 30, 2031. I want to talk about information on what my pursuits are, what those things in my life that I want more of, how those are going, what things I am pursuing in those those avenues of life, any projects that I'm doing uh, related to that stuff. And I'll probably point you over to the other channel that I've got out here, which is for the workshop itself, which is Obscurity Works. Uh, and also then to describe sort of what the life we're building looks like, do some video essays, some explanations of things that I've come to understand and think it'd be interesting for other people to know. And so that sort of forms the, the framework for what these videos on this channel are probably going to be about. 
and I hope you'll join me in that and in, and uh, follow along on that that overall goal. And with that, if you found this video useful and you think YouTube should show it to some other people, go ahead and like. I'm not going to ask you to like at the beginning of the video before you've actually seen the video, whether you like it or not. I'm going to wait till the end. If you want to follow along and want to not be notified when things happen, go ahead and subscribe. That is the way YouTube does this thing. And if you didn't like the video or you have some feedback that you'd like to give, feel free to leave a comment. I will say that if you were one of the people who lacks the skills to comment in a positive and constructive way, or to share your opinion in a way that, that communicates without hurting other people and without being kind, that I would invite you to take this comment section as an opportunity to practice those skills rather than to demonstrate that you don't have them. And with that, I will see you next time.